So I am standing between you and Vida, who's going to show you all about database access. He's got the cool stuff. We'll see how long we go. This, uh, this, can you hear back there? No? Kind of? Maybe you have to be louder. There we go. Let me ask you a question right up front. Is there anyone here who's a data scientist? Not one? Not a data scientist? This, this falls in the category, I need a doctor in the room. Have you heard that phrase before? I need a doctor, a PhD in data science. Nobody? You got a PhD? Okay, all right. Yeah, see, he's getting there. So if I, if I fall down on this presentation, you got to jump on stage. That's how this works. Because let me tell you right away, I am not a data scientist. So I'm going to be pretending to be one on TV or on camera or on stage. But we're going to show you what it means to work with data scientists and how they become part of the application workflow. And we have a very cool workshop that we're not going to workshop it. I'm going to just run you through the workshop, though, so you can see the resulting application. It's an object detection application. And the cool thing is, after we show you the demonstration, you can then do this on your own, right? You can go back home and try it yourself. It's a very clever little application. As an object detector, it can determine between dogs or cats. That's actually how we used to demo it. Maybe we'll try that today. In other words, that was actually the key breakthrough. So I forget how many eons ago, but it was actually not that long ago. It was probably about 10 years ago when a, a person who is a PhD was doing their data science thing. They figured out that if they could train a machine learning model, feeding it enough dogs and enough cats, that the uh, AI could determine a dog or a cat. That was the major breakthrough. So we actually use that as a demo because it's kind of fun. You might think that sounds easy. A human can tell a dog versus a cat but a computer can now tell dog versus cat. They're both furry, they both have four legs, they both sometimes have tails, so you know, how could it tell that? So it actually took a lot of effort. Now this is an open source thing. So by the way, everything I'm showing you is free open source, you can try it yourself. So we don't actually have a lot of slideware. Let me just tell you a couple little stories though. The way I got into this AIML world was, again, I'm not a data scientist, we have them at Red Hat, and we had one actually train us a system Basically, train a model that looked for vibration, vibration patterns. So if you actually work in a manufacturing world, you know, where people make things with big fans and conveyor belts and all those machines, well, vibration is the leading indicator of potential machine failure. This is also true of your car, by the way. If you've actually been around cars long enough and it starts doing the da -da 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 thing, you take it to the mechanic because something is about to fall off or something is about to break. A belt's going to break, an axle's going to break, a bearing is probably burnt out. And often it's those little bearings, right? The bearings in the wheel, the bearing, the bearings in a fan. So we actually did a whole, huge presentation where we had everyone train. We trained a model with people's accelerometers in the phones. So earlier today when we had you shake the phone, right, to, to drive that application, well, we had done that before. And we actually looked for certain patterns in the shakes. In other words, we could tell if you were doing this, or doing this. And then we got to the point where we could tell you were doing this. And we trained a model to do that. And then we decided to have fun with it. We could tell if you were doing this. Right? Like seriously, we had people doing their Travolta move. And in this case, what the application did was that caused damage to a machine. The vibrations that match the pattern caused damage. And then we had a little bit, group of repairmen that would come out and work on the machine. Because that's what you would do in a manufacturing sense, right? Would repair people would go out and fix whatever the damage is. So that was an example of machine learning, an example of using a data scientist to actually help train a model. And then we also did this one, which is based on the demo we're going to show you today. So this was an object detection demonstration, and we gamified it in a very clever way, because what we said was like a where's Waldo, like find the horse. And so people in the audience had to get their camera and kind of isolate the horse. And if they got a good shot of the horse into their camera phone on their smartphone, you got points for that if we got the right match. And I'll tell you, there was one thing that we had to do that was actually fairly clever. The model that we trained to do this had to ignore false positives. And so that's actually how we got it really well gamified so people could really score good points and win. So there's a lot of objects on here that the model just ignored. Right? So we want to make sure that the things it should find, it found, and the things it should ignore, it ignored. Because by default, what you'll see when we just show you the raw model, 
it just tries to guess at everything, right? It's like flower, bear, man, right? It's just trying everything, and that's the model we have today. But this is exactly the same kind of idea, and this, of course, is our keynote demo from a few years ago. So if you have access to the slide deck, right, uh, bit.ly AI ML notebook, you, you can actually then get access to that, uh, those videos, right? So those are both videos, but we're going to show you a live demo today. Now, this is my workflow diagram. This is kind of how the data scientist lives amongst all us application developers and IT ops people, okay? So remember earlier, we were talking about a platform engineer and all those type of folks? But a data scientist is also part of this as well, as well as a data engineer, okay? So the way this normally goes is the business leadership says, we want to solve a business problem. We want to have some form of trained model that processes mortgages, right? So when a mortgage application comes in, instead of having a human review it, we want a trained model to review that mortgage and quickly accept it or quickly reject it, or maybe reject it right away, or and then if it's okay, maybe send it to a real human, right? You can decide if humans are involved or not involved. And by the way, you probably do want humans still involved. Because what will happen is a model can actually have bias. All right, so just keep that in mind. Models actually have something known as bias, meaning the people who trained it, they have trained it on a data set that actually puts bias right into the decision making. So therefore, you might have a mortgage application model that rejects people that it should not, that are legally protected <laughs> in your society. This actually was something that happened in the U.S. that realized that it was doing illegal activity but it was the bias of the scientists putting their data in and training the model. So you want to be careful of things like that. Another thing that's super important to understand is a model is trained on a chunk of data during a period of time, okay? So the data scientist, right, so the beta, well, let's do this. The business leadership sets the goal. We want to train a model. The data engineer gathers the data, right? I have to pull data from this system, this mainframe, this database. I've got to go to the data warehouse, the data lake. Build a new data lake, right? They got to get all the data scrubbed and ready. Of course, the data scientist then takes all that data. Typically, what you do is you give them a bunch of CSV files. You basically go to S3 or a big old hard drive or something, and you just give them a big pile of data, and they go digging through it, okay? And they figure out how to write their code to basically train their model. And what's funny about that, that data, if you think about it, is a point in time, right? They're basically saying, I'm looking over the last six months of data to train my model. And that's a point in time, because what happens six months from now, where their data that they had is six months old, okay? So that's another important thing to understand, is the thing can drift. Not the model. The model hasn't changed. Version 1.0 of the model is still the version 1.0 of the code, right? But the data set has slightly shifted over time, so therefore you actually need to monitor the model in production. Is it scoring more poorly? What you'll see when we show it to you is the difference between an AIML model, a machine learning model, and code is normally if you write code, how many people here write code of some sort? Okay, yeah, a lot of you. So if you write code, you say, if the sky is blue, then do this, right? You say, if the account balance is over $200, then do that, right? You write, you write declarative code or you write definitive code, if you will, imperative code, I should say, and it does what equals something or less than something, greater than something. A model's not that way. You give it your parameters, and it comes back and says, blue-ish, sky is blue-ish, 82%. It gives you a percentage of what it thinks the answer is. And that means you have to change the way you write your regular application code around it. 82 might be okay. Yeah, we'll give a... We'll basically approve that mortgage with 82%. But what happens is as the data changes over time, maybe the customer base changes over time, maybe now it's 81%. And then six months from now, it's now 80%. And now, six months from then, it's 79%. And somebody goes, whoa, this, uh, this algorithm is a little too poor now. Let's train that model again. So that's what that feedback loop here is for retrain models. You, do, you need to be monitoring your models in production and it's not model drift. Some people call it model drift. The model hasn't changed. The data stream has changed. And now the model is just not as good as it once was. Look for that percentage. That's a key element. So when we were doing that object detection game, we were looking to see if you got the horse greater than 
That was what our code said. It said, yep, you scored the horse, if that's the object we wanted you looking for. So you'll see that when we get into the demo. So just keep in mind that there's the data engineer, the data scientist, the machine, um, learn, uh, machine modeling, machine learning engineer, right? They're really kind of dealing with the packaging of the models themselves. The models are special artifacts. And then app devs basically throw some, you know, rest code around it. Like you might just wrap it with a Python wrapper, put a Flask app, G-Unicorn app, and that's just a rest endpoint. So everyone else in the world just uses a rest call, or maybe it's a Kafka message that comes in that triggers it. We found all kinds of clever ways to trigger the model, but that's what the app developer does. And of course, your operations folks are part of this, your platform engineering folks are part of this, everybody else, SRE, is part of this too, because this system might run on a big old OpenShift cluster, like we're going to run today, might run on a bunch of VMs, might run on the cloud. All right, so that's the workflow that's important to understand. And this is the thing we're going to go play with. So here's what we're going to go do, okay? This, by the way, is, an, is a workshop. So let's walk you through it. And uh, where to go, where to go here, okay, all right? Okay, so, hmm, I'm trying to think for a second. I haven't slept much, did I mention that? So, uh, <laughs> so what we're going to do is just walk you through it. I've already got it loaded, so we're not going to be able to see it soup to nuts, if you will. But basically, if you have an OpenShift data science uh, install, and it's actually part of our free online sandbox. You've heard about the sandbox today. You can just go there, and it's, it's there. So, like, here's the sandbox. Here's the topology view. Look right here at this icon. You'll see Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. So it's under this icon kind of hidden over to the side here. And this is, again, an entirely free environment. When you click on that, it's going to open up this little window here. But it, it does know that I've uh, launched a Jupyter Notebook already. But you can see right here, when I click over to data science mode, I have something like NVIDIA GPU add-on. I have thinking about Kafka streams. You saw uh, that in Jaya's presentation earlier. OpenVINO is interesting. It allows you to use um, things that would otherwise need GPUs, but on Intel, right? So OpenVINO comes from Intel. It helps you run uh, accelerated work on Intel. And the Jupyter Notebook, which is the, the important part here, right? That's the interesting part. And so if you click on that, it wants you to launch a notebook, but you can see I already have a notebook up and running. So let's just go into that notebook, and this is what it looks like, okay? So the note, Jupyter Notebook is a IDE, a Python-based IDE, that a data scientist would use. It is their development tool, and it's browser-based by default. So therefore, you can run it in a pod very easily. That's kind of the cool part. By default, if you actually support, does anyone here support any Jupyter Notebook people at this point? from an operations perspective, a couple of you. So are you doing that with virtual machines or are you doing that as containers? What's that? Containers for you and VMs for you? Okay, and that's common, right? You would set up a, uh, a Jupyter Notebook server on VMs and the data scientists could use it or you could set up in containers. In this case, it's all running in a container, but this is the tool they're going to use and it's how they like to work. You can also run this directly on your laptop, too, a notebook directly on your laptop. If you're a student, that's actually how you normally do it. But if you're in an enterprise environment, you might want to give them virtual machines. You might want to give them, you know, a container. Uh, and you can also give them access to GPUs inside the cluster also if you want. This one doesn't have any, but everything works fine. It's just a little slower, okay? Um, and here you can kind of see there's a little bit of code there. And so you basically will just edit the code like you would in Python. And I'm not really a Python person, but I can pretend to be one. Okay, you know, I can do things like, uh, you know, hello world. Uh, there, there, there we go. Whoop. And hit the little play button right here. See that one? And then it's going to execute that block of code. So one thing to get, to kind of get your head around here, it's block by block. Okay, it's almost like line by line or block by block. And you would execute block one before you get down here and execute block two. Like if I say execute block two here, you can say this is what you entered high. So it says new text and my text. See there, print some text. So you got to, you couldn't execute this block until this block has been executed because this block, print some text, depends on a function declared up here in this block. So that can get a little bit funny because the user can click down two or three steps and execute the wrong block. I do that to myself. You can also put markdown in here. This is kind of cool. So let's see if I can get that to edit. So I can come here and say I want to, um, you know, I guess I can call this quad hash uh, stuff. Uh, take that out, you know, and this is just markdown, right? Just put in, so, so this is the third level. 
and there's the fourth level. So this nicely allows you to document things inside the, um, inside the environment. All right. Ah, wait, hit play. There we go. And so you can actually have your documentation in line. And you will see that with, when you work with data scientists, they like doing that. They're like, okay, I, here's what this block of code means. Here's some documentation. Here's what this block, documentation. And so this is the Jupyter Notebook environment. It should be noted there's some other elements here that are important. That's your Git. How do I import from Git? Okay. Bump, bump, bump. Oh. And you can see that I already have a Git repo imported here. And you can kind of see my master branch there. So that's, that's an element. And so you can interact with Git, a Git repo. And while apparently data scientists don't like doing that normally, you try to teach them to because things in version control are helpful, right? Um, and I only say that because some of the folks I've talked to are like, yeah, data scientists may not check anything in the Git. It's just not how they think. That's on their laptop. It's good. It's all good there. Well, that might be a million dollars worth of code on their laptop. So <laughs> you might want to get it checked into a repository of some sort. And then you'll look here. This is where it gets interesting. Okay, so this is just kind of how notebook works. But now you want to explore the data, right? So apparently the process they like to use, and again, I'm not a data scientist. But when I work with them, they're like, Burr, give us the data. Tell us what the parameters are of the business case, the problem space, and give us a week. This happens, this has literally happened to me multiple times with the folks that I work with at Red Hat. I'm like, okay, here's what I want. I want the, I call that the scavenger hunt demo, right? You have to find the objects on the page. And in the case of the vibration sensing demo, we actually refer to that as a dancing demo because there's all these dance moves we have people do in it. And if you see the video, there might be a moment where you actually see a thousand people doing dance moves in the big audience that we had there. Because we had a 1,200, 1,300 person audience uh, running, that, running that little thing on their phone. But, you know, we gave, the, we gave the data scientists those kind of parameters. And in the case of the mobile phone one, we actually had to build a little system right up front. A little system that was nothing more than the accelerometer capture that basically took all the data off the accelerometer, shoved it in big JSON chunks, and then we literally handed the guy a bunch of JSON. It's like, okay, here's data, You're right? And he, and he basically just had to go, okay, what movement were you doing with this JSON? What movement were you doing? Or what movement were you doing? We, so it was about 30 to 40 of us who just sat there and did this stuff all day. Uh, you know what I mean? Or even this one. And he eventually figured out the patterns in the data set to basically train a model. And then we also did one that was Battleship. You guys know Battleship, where you put little pegs on a ship, you know, you... You, do, you go for B5, I go for C2, and you go for B6, and I go for C3, I go for B7. You go, oh, you sank my battleship, right, that game. Well, we trained an AI model to play the game. And that was another one of our demos, right? And again, that was just another thing where we kept playing enough, and, he, and we captured the data, kept handing it to our data scientists, and over time he figured out how to beat us. He could beat us pretty well by the time we did this for a couple months. So it's that you have, the reason I'm making that point is this is an iterative process. Sometimes you've got to gather the data, give them the data, they iterate, they get a model, you test the model, not good enough, send it back, and you go back and forth, and it's just like a piece of code from that perspective, okay? So you can see where it says exploratory, you will, they will be prototyping in here. So they'll be in here running things in here related to TensorFlow, they'll be in here running things to, related to S3 right here, so here's S3. S3 might be where you store your data, so you can hand it to them. You could hand it to them on a flash drive. And if they're a student, that's probably what you do. Give them on a flash drive, right? But if they're an enterprise employee, you know, you got to put it someplace. And sometimes it's large, right? It's a large data set. So S3 is a nice place to chunk it up in the cloud and they can download it from there. Um, or you just might have some sort of, you know, internal um, st uh, storage. And let's see here. Let me... I'm just running my little cells. Notice also, what, when I hit run, you'll see a little ash there, right? So watch that closely when I hit run. That means it's executing, okay? And see it downloaded this two dogs JPEG. And so if you watch it, when I click it, you'll see it execute, then it quickly gets done. And so this is literally running it through TensorFlow in the TensorFlow model, okay? You see the matrix being built here. It's trying to identify what's in that image. And you can see the model specifically the model directory listed here, okay? And again, I'm not a data scientist. I don't dig into the models. The cool thing about this model, it's completely free and open source. So all you got to do is put the wrapper around it and you can use it. So that's why I like this one. I don't have to be a data scientist and I can come in here and play with it 
Oh, kernel got it. something died. Kernel's restarting. So you will notice that too at Jupyter Notebooks. It has the concept of the kernel. So let's see if it restarts and comes back to life for me. Kernel, not like Linux kernel, it's just what it calls its internal runtime environment. So okay, look, it righted itself there. I think we're okay again. That happens to be from time to time. I've noticed that before. And let's go here. And let's go here. Oh, that one's still running, see? With a little asterisk. That's how you know it's thinking. <laughs> so that's the, oh, right there, got done. Okay, so there it, it found and labeled. So that's one thing with object detection. It's trying to find things and labeling, or label them, right? So someone's trained the model with labels, meaning this is a dog, D-O-G. That's the label, right? Or, or whatever it might be trying to find. And of course, it can take a long time to train these models, depending on what you're feeding it. In the case of images, though, people have worked really hard to open source all these image trained models. So let's see here. And there we go. And so it says DOG. Oh, it's too blurry there, but we'll see it better. But it says DOG 84%. Let's see here. And here. And still too blurry there. Okay. But that, you basically, that's the interaction model. Work with the data, train the model, write different logic. And there might be logic that actually looks like regular logic in addition to these models that we're dealing with here. But the whole goal is to, the, you, to you get to a prediction algorithm. In other words, a model that you keep feeding it training data. And by the way, this is the training environment. But then you basically get it to the point where you think it's trained well enough to give you quality answers. This model actually is specifically optimized for speed, though. So it actually does not give you great accuracy because we want it to respond quickly. That's another thing that's also interesting about these technologies. If you don't have a GPU, because it does run on Intel CPUs in many cases, regular CPUs, you will find that when you hit it with a request, it might take two seconds to respond. It's like it's got, it can have a very high latency. So latency is one of those things you've got to factor into the equation because a two-second response may be too long for your application. In the case of that uh, vibration sensing game where we're jamming accelerometer data in from a thousand phones concurrently all through a Kafka thing, just like we did this morning, but in that case, we're actually analyzing the movements. We, a two-second thing was killing us, right? We, it was just killing our our usability of the application was just taking too damn long. But, you know, you work on that. That's another thing you iterate on. You make it faster, make it more performant. You might have to make it less accurate, right? You know, to give it a better performance. And that's what's been done in this particular model. Uh, okay, you can see right here, if you're a Python person, any Python people in the room? Yeah? So pip install requirements.txt. You guys got that one, right? That's pretty standard stuff. And you kind of see what the uh, different packages that have been pulled in here. Flask, of course, is how we get a little HTTP endpoint to wrap this with. And you can see there's the uh, matplotlib as an example. Okay. And TensorBoard. Uh, what else is here? Google Auth. You know, it's a lot, of, a lot of interesting things in there. But it's, you know, it is a standard kind of TensorFlow model. And let's go here and try this one. And do I have my other? Let's go look over here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So two dogs. Actually, let's change this out. So, let, so let's try the cow on puppers. Let's see if we can actually change the code. So I have this cow image over here. Let's see if I got the right name. That might be a PNG, so let me make sure I got it right. No, G, JPG. There we go. Okay, so let's re-execute this block since I changed the name of the image that it needs to pull. And let's go run. Let's see the import numpy there. And uh, let's see. Oh, not too. I got to change it in multiple places. Uh, on puppers. Okay. Let's see if we got this right. It's thinking about it. It's thinking. It's thinking. See, it's thinking. That's what that means. How long is it going to think? And again, it can be. It can actually, depending on what you've done, right? It can be a little slow sometimes. But that is again is part of the iterative process. You work on that to make it if you want it to be more performant. Or, or more latent, right? You can, you can make those choices. Come on now. I know I changed your image on you, but it shouldn't have freaked you out that much. The, uh, uh, there's other ways to change those things, but I was figured I'd give it a quick hack here to see if it would actually find my cow instead of my dogs. No, no, no. And actually, I do have an image here. This is actually my real dog. You can see what it did here. So dog, 81%. So this is me taking a picture of the dog before I left home kind of thing. So dog 81%, that's a high score. 
And my dog is very funny looking. So at one point I took a picture and it said, uh, 51% dog, 49% cat. I, I know I have a funny looking dog. And boy, this it's not going to finish. We'll, we'll just leave that. We'll come back to that in a second. And so this is the flask application. Let's see if the flask application is up. And we'll run a test against it real fast. Let's see here. Okay. All right. So this was using the cow one. And come on now. Yep, 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 yep. And here. Okay, but this is the process, right? Uh, as a, if you're an application developer, you would basically be interacting with your code, and as a data scientist, you'd be interacting with this code. So, okay, get size deprecated. Okay, I understand that. No worries there. I did click this one. Oh, it's still running. So there's something going on in my notebook that's a little slow. Did it do it? There it is. All right, there's my cow. And again, that we can't quite see it there, but we'll see it later. So there's my cow. Found the cow. It also found some grass, things like that. Okay, and I can pick different images. Let's let's go in here and change it one more time. Uh, where to go? Right up here. There was this one that someone just sent me while I was here in with you guys, and I thought it was funny. And since uh, Jay talked about the shirt, there's actually a shirt that says Kubernetes, but it's got my face on it. And uh, there's some people who were God, I can't type today wearing it, and then they sent me a photo. I think I typed that incorrectly. That's the image right there. I can just upload images by hitting this little upload button, you know, picking stuff from my hard drive. I don't know. Is there, is there interesting, something interesting to see here? Not really. Um, but I uploaded this one. And so let's run that. And actually, let's just run them all. There's another button here that basically says run the whole thing. Uh, restart and run the whole thing. Let's try that one. So you can see it going to the asterisk there. And so it queues them up, executes, execute, there it goes, there, there. So when it turns back into a number, that's when you know it's finished execution. Come on now. And um, so before you see it had blue jeans. <laughs> so it isn't always sure, but you've got to look at the percentage. And that was a 12% blue jeans. So you have to say, nope, 12% on blue jeans, not covering it. But here we go. So it didn't actually pick up my face as a human face, but it picked up their faces as human faces. Okay? So here, here's what's cool about that. This is the process you go through to test a model, build a model. Once you have a model, then it's actually pretty straightforward. All you got to do is basically deploy it, assuming you have the application developer, wrap it with an app, uh, application endpoint. And that's what we did here. So in this case, what you saw earlier with use of the dev console is you just come in here and say import from Git and you import it and run the application. So that's what I did earlier. Uh, so that's what's running right here. And that has an endpoint on it. So if I open that up, okay, you see it says status okay. All right, status okay, because it's the back end. It's the wrapper for the back end and the model itself. There's a front end to this based on Node.js. And if I open up that URL, let's see how it does here. Here we go. All right. All right, so look at that. It got, it got glasses, 50%, human hair, human face. Man, 34%. Man, 69%. But again, this one's trained to be fast, right? So it's just trying to be fast. And let's try this now. Uh, so, okay, let me see if it gets my cat right here. Not my cat, just one I found on the internet. So let's see where it, yep, oh, look at that, cat, 60%. And it picked that up off my phone. So a picture on my phone, taking a picture, <laughs> right? Uh, let's try this. Let's try this here. Let's try, let's try our dog. Uh-huh. All right, try again. There's our dog. Get the reflection right. Whoop. It's a puppy. Let's see, dog, 51%, or human face, 17%. But, but think about that for a second. You guys, see, you guys see what I mean by the, it's not a perfect thing. It basically gives you, it always gives you the answer and a percentage of what it thought that answer was. This is important because if you're writing code around this in your system, and we did that for all those demonstrations I talked about, you have to then decide as the programmer having received the model and wrapping it with the rest endpoint, 
17%, I'm going to discard that answer. I'm going to ignore it. So you, that's how you'll filter out those kinds of false positives. Like, okay, 17% was too far away from anything I would do from a business logic standpoint. I won't approve that mortgage, okay, <laughs> And if that's what it was. Maybe a 51% is also too low. Again, this model was trained so that it was quick. It's relatively speedy. Therefore, it's going to just give you a quick hit. You can actually train them so that they're diff they really are going to be more close to the answer you want. And then you get 80% kind of answers, 90% kind of answers. And that might be what you need for your use case. Uh, you can see right here, it also found, it found me and other things in the background here. Clothing, 22%, you know. So you'd have to decide what is a good answer and what is a bad answer. And I think that's an important thing to understand if you are a programmer. When you work with the data scientists and, the, and, the, and a project like this, you have to communicate with them. You know, they're giving you answers. And you may decide, oh, those answers aren't quite good enough. And then you also have to decide in your workflow, if the answer is kind of weak, when do you kick it over to a real human to review like you used to before you tried to use an AI AML model, right? Like, let a human look at that versus the chat bot versus the mortgage approver, versus the image classifier, that's essentially what this is, versus the battleship player, right, or the uh, vibration detector. So all these things are nice little models. And what I'd like you guys to think about here is this is, and we're running pretty close on time here, all this is documented in what we call the object detection workshop. I'll give the URL. But you can see it basically walks you through the whole process, how to find it in the sandbox. And the instructions aren't perfect. We probably have some bugs in here. Uh, you'll see right here it says start a tensor flow. Pick default. It's actually, it actually says small now on that side. Um, also, if you are in a, if you're in the notebook and things get a little bit wonky, you can come over here and restart the notebook. Hub control panel. Right? So you might have to stop it and restart it. So like, let's, let me try that. We've already run it. So let's stop it. And then let us uh, kick it off again. It's like here you might see kick it off with a small container size. And that's, all, that's all you get in the sandbox environment. But you can also add environment variables. So part of the workshop, by the way, goes on to connect it to actually Kafka. And so I don't have it set up right now, but with Kafka, it'll start grabbing frames. Right? So you can use your phone and go scan, 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 scan. And it's grabbing frames from the video stream and sending them over and scoring those. So Kafka uses a streaming engine to then pump it to the model who gives you the answer and then the answer just goes, you know, has a little, tells you what it is. So uh, you would use your environment variables to connect to a database, use your environment variables to connect to a, um, a, a database, a regular database or a Kafka and Python connects to those also, right? So the data scientists could be drawing from those data sets as they do their work. You'll see more about that in Vita's presentation as he talks about how to get access to data. But here, uh, let me just pick TensorFlow again and hit Start Server. I failed to create notebook. Please try again later. So sometimes I've had this problem on the sandbox. It does seem to fail on this. It is a free environment, okay? It is a free environment, so I have seen it fail a few times. Uh, let's see here. Maybe because it thought I had an environment variable slightly started there. Apparently that's what it was. <laughs> um, so, you know, watch out for that. Let's see if, I'm curious to see if it goes through. Notice the PVC attached. It does try to remember your data for a, little, a short period of time. So if you do have data loaded in a PVC, PVC stands for Persistent Volume Claim in Kubernetes. Persistent volume, that's how you have some non-ephemeral storage in a Kubernetes cluster. And a Jupyter Notebook wants non-ephemeral storage because if the data scientist has been working and collecting the data and working on it, they don't want that data to disappear. In this particular notebook, though, you do see that it pulls what it needs from S3 kind of every time just to be on the safe side. So let that run. And what else is important here? Oh, so object detection, we talked about that already. And oh, so I meant, this is by the way where it sits, object detection rest, that's what I imported. This is where the models sit. Again, it's based on the open images v4, mobile net. The, that's over here, right? So you can see that's on TensorFlow Hub. That's where we got the object detection uh, machine learning algorithm from. So we didn't make this, right? We just used it. So there's a lot of great open source models that are out there you might just have fun with, like this one. And then you can see here's, the, this is the open image data set and it talks about some of the things it can do, like detection boxes and things like that. 
So there's a lot that's happening happened in the object detection world. So you can then have fun with it you know, like we did and gamify it. Let's see what else here. What I did with the demo you saw earlier. Oh, actually, let's try this real quick. I should have said this. You guys don't want to just see me taking pictures, right? You want to take pictures. Let's see if that'll work. Where'd it go? Yeah. Here, try it. Let's see if you can blow up my system. It probably will blow it up. Uh, let's see here. Oh. Oh, I got to come in a different angle here. There we go. All right, loading, loading, loading. It's and iOS is going to say, "Am I allowed to talk to the camera?" Yes, I am. All right. Let me turn this around. Whoop. Yeah, look at that. Oh, look at. All right, we got the selfie with the. Human face, 52%. I'm a man, 30% this time. <laughs> yep. Would it work for you guys? Look at that. And this is all running on a single pod on a free environment. So you guys are actually bang banging on the system pretty hard right now. Clothing, 19%. I got a 49% man that time. Okay. But that, you can see, that workshop is available to you. It's all out there. Here are the URLs you'll want to have. And we're basically out of time here, so let me finish this up. So you can see, this is what we did. We did this thing called RHODS, Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, OD Workshop for Object Detection. There's also a license plate detector that's kind of cool. So it recognizes license plates off cars. Mostly UK cars, though. All right, so I don't know if it'll work off Indian cars. It doesn't really work off American cars because it was trained off British cars. So if you have British license pl plates, it does a nice job. Uh, that one is actually an interesting one. It's for environmental related activity. Let's basically, we're looking at cars as they travel through traffic cameras. It's kind of the point. And maybe you have people that are commuting too much. Uh, all of these things, by the way, you've heard about somewhat today. We have all these tutorials that are out there for Tekton, Argo, which is what I showed you in the previous session, Knative, Quarkus, OpenShift, raw Kubernetes, raw containers. So these tutorials are available to you guys to go try. They're just GitHub repos. And yeah, they, may, they might not be completely up to date because we haven't had someone go look at it in a while and update it, but do check them out. You can also issue pull requests against them. And these are the ones that we are working on today, or this one in particular. So do give that a try, and then you can run it on your own and press your friends right? Your spouse with object detection. <laughs> Just make sure that if it's your, you know, let's say your wife and you go, oh, 42% man. But, and I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I saw this happen one time. It didn't go so well. <laughs> yeah. And, and it will do that, by the way. So just watch what it does there and maybe wrap it with a little additional logic. Okay. Well, I thank you for your time. Let me go ahead and wrap up. Yeah, I just have one question. So whatever you showed right now, is this available on OpenShift Local as well? Or? OpenShift Local? It should work on, but I don't know. Okay. So uh, the, the, uh, the Jupyter Notebook capability is part of what's called Open Data Hub. We'd have to figure out if Open Data Hub runs on OpenShift Local. Okay. Uh, the actual product, Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, which is part of the sandbox, does not run on OpenShift Local. It's not certified for that environment. And okay. it, it does take a little beef, right? There's notebooks are not cheap and easy. You got to give them a little. You got to give them some cores. You got to get some memory. Um, well, like we have like a bunch of on-prem machines right now. Yeah. And uh, so I was just wondering. Because yeah, this is we are using some kind of uh, Jupyter controller should work. Yeah, yeah, it should work, but I don't. I don't know if it's. It's gonna. It's a beefy thing. Uh, it should be fine. Yeah. He thinks it will work. Give it a try. But when it comes to OCP, like OpenShift uh, Container Platform on your on-premises, it is coming as a certified supported solution there. All right. Yeah. Thank you.